If there are any questions or comments, we can take them now. Um, the four month delay was pretty interesting. Um, is there anything about it that we can apply to our own lives or our own uh, our own dealings day to day? I mean, I think on an individual level, you know, when I read this verse and I try to ask myself, what is, you know, what's something actionable? What's a practical lesson that I can take in my own life? It's that we shouldn't be reactionary. You know, just as I had mentioned, you know, when, when people do things to provoke you, it's very easy to be reactionary and be impulsive. However, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, four-month four break. You know, let everybody calm down. Let everyone align themselves in the place that they want to be. So I think that the takeaway message is that, you know, when we're provoked, when we're angry, when emotions are running high, we have to step back. We have to make wise decisions. We have to be prudent. And uh, we should not be reactionary. We should consider all of the consequences so this is i think a very practical lesson that we can learn so if, you know when you become angry for example the ahadith say if you're angry and you're sitting down stand up if you're standing up sit down if you're angry if someone provokes you you're not you're not level-headed at the moment go perform wudu. so these are some of the things that we can we can apply on the on an individual level that not to be reactionary to kind of pause before we make decisions, especially you know when we're talking about decisions that could actually, you know, uh, endanger people's lives. Uh, thank you. And um, what was? Uh, could you explain more about why there is no Bismillah at the beginning of the surah? Because you you mentioned examples of a uh, combined surahs, but the other combined ones start with Bismillah. So yeah. So the reason, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a statement that, you know, evokes God's mercy and his compassion. You know, there are two names of Allah that are mentioned, ar-Rahman and ar-Rahim. And they're both derived from the word Rahman. Now, the message of Surah at tawbah unlike the other surahs, is centered around divine wrath. That this is a surah that's essentially declaring war against the mushrikeen who have violated the treaty that they've conducted with the Holy Prophet. So it wouldn't make sense to invoke God's mercy and also mention that this is a declaration of war. Just like Amir al-Mu'mineen mentions, he says that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is used as an expression of security and mercy whereas the the message and the objective of surah at tawbah is to deliver a stern warning and a declaration of military conflict and war so the message of surah at tawbah is divine wrath whereas bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim is is used in areas where we want to remind people of allah Allah's mercy. Surah Al-Fil and Surah Al-Duha, they, they do contain very stern verses, promises of punishment. However, comparatively, Surah Al-Tawbah is a lot more, it's a lot more stern. And the, the purpose of this Surah was to, to declare war. And, and this is exactly what happened when the Holy Prophet sent Amir al-Mu'mineen to Mecca, he essentially goes there to declare war, to declare military conflict against the the mushrikeen who had violated the terms uh, of the uh, the treaty. So it would be contradictory to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. By the way, we're going to war. You see, so it's so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants them to feel that this is that this is serious. That you have deprived yourself. Of God's mercy you have provoked his messenger you have shed innocent blood you have you've committed treason against the Islamic State you have you have disrupted this uh, period of peace and you will be dealt with uh, 
very uh, swiftly and harshly. And um, you provided a couple possible definitions of the greater Hajj. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't quite sure which one you mentioned as being the right. Which one is the right so, one? So the, the, the awayat of Ahlul Bayt, they say the day of the greater Hajj is the 10th of the Hajjah, which is the day of Eid, Yom Nah, the day where you sacrifice the, the animals. And it's called the greater Hajj. So now we know the day. 10th of uh, the Hijjah. Some commentators propose that it's called the Greater Hajj either because it's Hajj and not Umrah, because Umrah is called Al Hajj al Asghar or Al Hajj al Akbar as the actual Hajj. And others have said that Hajj al Akbar is a reference to that, that year where Muslims and Mushrikeen were performing Hajj together. So you're looking at 8th and ninth year after the Hijrah, because after that, the Mushrikeen were banned from ent entering Masjid al-Haram. So it's the greater Hajj because of the presence of both Muslims and polytheists. But the day, according to the Rawayat of Ahlul Bayt, was the 10th of the Hijrah. So just to clarify, are you saying that like every year during the the tenth of Zulhajjah is considered the greater Hajj, or was it just during the eighth and ninth? Yeah, j just j specifically during the ninth, because this is when the surah was revealed, Yom al Hajj al Akbar. So, uh, your your question is, is 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 do we call every every tenth of the Hajj al Hajj al Akbar? Yes. It doesn't seem like that's the case. The fuqaha don't refer to the 10th of the Hajj every year as being a Hajj al -Akbar. This specific year, we know for sure. Other years, I haven't seen any evidence or any any indication that it would be called Hajj al -Akbar. So those who say that it's called Hajj al -Akbar because of the presence of the Mushrikeen alongside the Muslims, then obviously it's only speaking about that time period. If you say that it's called al Hajj al -Akbar, because it's it's Umrah, it's it's Hajj and not Umrah, then you can consider uh, you can you can call Hajj al Hajj al Akbar. But the day itself, it would probably be specified to that time. And uh, you mentioned uh, a separate a verse that should be read recited before starting this uh, reading Surah Tawbah instead of uh, yes. Salah. It's not it's not a verse. It's essentially a dua. You know, just like you say, "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Usually when we begin the recitation of the Qur'an, we seek refuge with Allah from shaytan, and then we say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and then we commence with the recitation of the surah. Now with surah al-Bara'a, it's recommended by the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam that you say, "A'udhu billahi min al-Nar, I seek refuge with God from the hellfire. So this is not an ayah, it's a dua. وَمِنْ شَرِّ الْكُفَّارِ وَمِنْ غَضَبِ الْجَبَّارِ وَالْعِزَّةُ لِلَّهِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And honor and glory belongs to Allah, His Messenger and the believers. So this is, it's recommended, it's not watch, it's recommended to recite this, this supplication before you begin the recitation of Surah al -Bara. Yeah, it's just interesting that it's um, so, I guess, uh, very different from the normal Bismillah, Azubillahi Mishnahim, Bismillah, Khandarim. It goes a lot more, uh, it's a lot longer, a lot more kind of gets covered after it. Yeah. And you'll see as we go through the surah, it, it will become clear as to, you know, because, you know, when Allah speaks about Munafiqeen, Munafiqeen are essentially kuffar in disguise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so this dua is a reminder of, of the damage that, that these individuals can do, whether they're external, whether they declare their kuf, or they hide it. So as we go through the surah, you'll see how dangerous these individuals are and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes to such lengths to guide the Prophet on how to deal with these, uh, with these internal enemies. And, and as well as the external enemies.
Because haq is always going to attract adversity. 